Some say Gottlieb Daimler invented the first motorbike helmet in the 1880s. It was essentially a leather cap with a fur lining, similar to that used by motorists, and only really provided protection against fast flying mosquitoes or possibly a sparrow that had eaten a small rock. A hat was probably just as effective, or even just having some hair on your head. The first genuine motorbike helmet appeared in 1914, when a Dr. Eric Gardner asked a fellow Englishman, Mr. Moss, to design a helmet with a hard outer shell. It had no internal padding of any sort, but could probably protect against a sparrow that had eaten a large rock. At first, the auto cycle union said to take their helmet and put it where the sun doesn't shine. But finally they saw sense and made them compulsory for the Isle of Man TT race in 1914. But everyday riders still wore thin leather helmets, if anything. And the leather helmet ads focused not on safety, but more on just preventing bad hair days. Helmet design got its next big boost from the death of Lawrence of Arabia in 1935. He'd survived numerous camel accidents, but went over the handlebars of his motorbike and died six days later. One of his neurosurgeons, an Australian called Hugh Cairns, got sufficiently pissed off at riders dying that he said, Struth, mate, this ain't good. Gonna have to do something about it. His research saw helmets designed specifically for motorbike riders and made them compulsory for army dispatch riders. These features included chin straps and also web slings on the inside to help absorb impacts. In Australia, Hugh is officially known as a good sport and not a bad bloke for saving countless lives of riders and people in many other sports as well. So what happened after World War II? Not a lot, apart from some stunt riding with some brill cream in the hair for protection. There was a bit of helmet research in the USA with the Navy funding investigations into head impact at universities. Some very cool chicks got into stunt riding, but head protection was limited to big hairstyles, a bow or a hat for ultra tricky stunts. In 1952, a huge step forward, the world's first ever performance-based motorbike helmet standard in the UK. The British Standard, 1869-1952. Helmet manufacturers were free to design the way they wanted to, as long as it passed the suite of tests. A brand new concept, and it rapidly led to other standards too. 1953, a Professor Lombard of the University of Southern California developed the first ever helmet with a polystyrene inner liner. Just like today's helmets, but sadly it was ineffective. It was going to take years of research to get this one right. Helmet standards took a bit longer in the USA. In 1957, William Snell died in a racing car accident despite wearing a helmet. A medical officer, George Snively, examined many racing helmets and found all of them lacking. It was a serious wake-up call for all the manufacturers. The Snell Foundation was formed the same year and created the first American performance-based standard in 1959 for racing car drivers. In the late 1960s, this was endorsed for use by motorbike riders as well. Helmet design through the 1960s was usually a fiberglass outer shell and polyurethane foam or cork liner. The world's first ever full face helmet appeared in 1963, made by Bell. The 1960s saw governments increasingly look at laws insisting on helmets when riding on public roads, a move many of the governments around the world made in the 1970s. Through the 1970s, the old pudding bowl style helmet was gradually replaced by the three-quarter helmet, which most riders preferred as early full-face helmets tended to be quite heavy. However, improvements in helmet design gradually saw the full face become light enough to become accepted by everyone, except ugly people willing to take a punt that a high-speed faceplant on the road might improve their looks. Helmet design and materials kept improving, with the last big shake-up coming up with the COST 327 study in 1996, the world's biggest ever research study into helmets, accidents and brain injuries. 
It resulted in the European standard, used in more than 50 countries worldwide and regarded by many as the best of an increasingly out-of-date bunch of standards. Helmets are still improving thanks to a small number of motivated manufacturers who are innovating and finding ways to improve the helmets within the confines of current standards. But essentially the guys who set our standards have failed to incorporate a pile of new testing procedures, design standards and innovations that could make helmets even safer. Making changes to a standard is serious business as lives depend on these being based on sound principles. Standards are a tool for two purposes. First, for evaluating available helmets. Second, as guides for designing new helmets. So, the standards need to be performance-based and not prescriptive. And sadly, there are examples of prescriptive standards happening in Australia and other countries. So in the meantime, if you're in the market for a new helmet, get informed before you decide. You've only got the one head, so use it well and look after it. <laughs>